you're hip and relevant. Yeah, Sid will say, I'm Elizabeth Medina. That's right. Um, I've been on staff for four years. Uh, this is my second year here at Madison. Uh, and I'm, I'm married to James Medina. <laughs> It's 
painful, especially if it's on stuck onto you. And then the second time you pull duct tape off from something, it sticks, but maybe not as well. Um, and then if you continue to do that again, and again, and again, and again, the duct tape no longer functions as it should, right? It no longer helps things stay in place. And this is the same for sex outside of a biblical context. It no longer functions as it's supposed to be. We can misuse and abuse it, and we can receive both physical and emotional damage. And so tonight, we're going to look at three different views on sex. Uh, and I think all of us, if we were honest with ourselves, one of these three views, kind of a, maybe a combination of all of them, or one of them would really describe how we view sex. So it's either a god to you, it's, it's gross, or it's a gift, a gift from God. And so let me explain each view, and hopefully we'll begin to see kind of which category you fit into. Um, and my goal for the night is for you to be able to evaluate where you're at, and hopefully to begin to start viewing sex as a gift from God. So the first one, we view, we view sex as a God. That sounds really intimidating and kind of scary. What, what does that mean? Well, really, this is where we find our identity. I'm gay, I'm straight, I'm bisexual. We can view sex as a God by whether or not we're having sex. It becomes a dominating aspect of our being. We treat sex as God by looking at pornography, by masturbating, by having oral sex, by looking at someone and wanting to engage in sexual acts with them, or really by having any sort of kind of sexual relationship outside of a heterosexual marriage. We treat sex as the most important thing. We choose sex in some form of kind of sexual immorality that I list above over Jesus. And that is idolatry. Worshiping the created instead of the creator. And to be honest with you all, uh, James and I, early on in our dating life, uh, we viewed sex as a god when we were dating. We dated long distance uh, for many years. And when we visited each other, at times we would find ourselves uh, alone, of course, late at night. Uh, very late. Nothing good happens after those hours. Um, and we didn't have strong physical boundaries or much accountability, which is really just a fancy word for not many of our friends were asking us, like, hey, what's going on with our relationship? How's, how's stuff going on? Are you, are you trying to attain what God wants for you? Like, purity, sexual purity? Uh, we didn't have that. And so we would sin sexually. We stayed technical virgins with each other, but really kind of did most of it. We value instant acceptance and love and gratification over Jesus and his work on the cross for us. We worship the created instead of the creator. And I share this with you because I'm sure many of you can relate. I'm sure many of you are in similar situations or you have been in similar situations before. And I speak as someone who has been single, who has dated, and who is not married. Um... Don't view sex as a god. I, I beg you, just don't, please. It causes more harm and hurt and pain than, than anything you want. View sex as God intended, a gift for us in marriage. So you're like, okay, maybe, maybe that's not true of you. Maybe you don't view sex as a god. Maybe you view sex as gross. Maybe you were told growing up, it's, it's dirty, it's gross, it's nasty, so save it for the person you love, your spouse. <laughs> that is an odd, odd statement, right? Right? Uh, you know, it kind of, kind of scares you into abstinence, right? Um, it kind of, kind of even causes thinking that like sex is shameful and, and wrong. So just, just don't do it. And you know, unfortunately, within the church or the Christian community, that can often be the view. We can often view our body and, and sex as, as gross and wrong. And that's just not true. That's just not true. Or maybe you view sex as gross because you've been sinned against. Uh, you, you've maybe been assaulted, raped, or abused. And you now view it as scary and gross. So of course, of course you can't view it as a gift from God. 
because you've received it outside of its context. And if this is true for you, I am sorry. I am really sorry. That person who sinned against you viewed sex as a bad. And if that's true of you, you'll probably have a long kind of road of, of recovery and healing. And it will be really important to seek out an environment of, of truth and grace over time. And, and maybe you need to seek uh, kind of professional help. Um, and, and of course, begin to start viewing yourself as God views you. That you're holy, that you're loved, that you're blameless and righteous. And let God continue to work out his redemptive plan for you. And finally, maybe some of you view sex as a gift from God. Uh, and if this is true of you, I am so proud of you. Way to go. Keep it that way. Fight to keep it that way. It's not easy. I know. I've been there. It's not easy. But fight to keep it that way. And maybe this is true of you because your parents, um, older siblings, your church, uh, older believers in your life, maybe they really share with you well how sex is a gift from God. And really, I think God gave us sex for six different reasons. Um, and I... I there is biblical precedent for these six reasons. Um, and I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through that tonight. If you want to talk with me more about those six different reasons, you can, or kind of find the biblical reference, you can talk to myself or James afterwards. Um, but I want to look at those. So the first one um, is, is for pleasure. God created us. He created sex. It's not a surprise to him. He knew we were going to have sex. It didn't shock him. The second reason is for reproduction, to, to have children, to populate the world. Children bring life and joy. I mean, look at any of the staff children. You, you can't help but like, be excited about life with them. Uh, the third reason is for knowledge. Um, really, it creates um, a knowledge or an intimacy between a husband and a wife. That it, There's no other person that has that same knowledge of that person. That is incredibly unique. The next is for protection against temptation. The fifth is for comfort. And the sixth is for oneness. Really, a husband and a wife, as they get married, they become one. And this idea of oneness is that they can even be naked and unashamed with each other. Both physically, sure, that's great. And emotionally and spiritually, I would say. They can really be themselves and who they are, share their deepest thoughts and feelings and fears and not have to be ashamed of sharing those things. And so, we see how God gave us human sex right from the beginning, when he created Adam and Eve. Sex and sexual desires aren't dirty or gross, and nor are they a right that must be acted upon whenever we feel like it. God created sex as a gift between a husband and a wife. And so you may be wondering, Elizabeth, this has been an all. That, that's great. But how do I change my view? How can I view sex as a gift from God? And so we're going to look at Colossians 3 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to open there. Otherwise, it will be on the screen. Um, but we are going to look at Colossians uh, chapter 3, like I said, verses 1 through 7. Um, and we're first going to read verses 1 through 4. So Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. So I'll read them for us. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so immediately, we see in verse 1, how Paul, the writer of Colossians, is telling us, if you identify yourself with Christ, if you have received Christ into your life, set your heart on things above. In essence, Paul is saying, let your heart be transformed. Don't let your heart be filled with anger, sex, with bitterness, or jealousy, but let it be filled with self-control, with joy, with peace, and with patience. So he first says, make sure your heart is set on Christ. And then the next thing that Paul says, make sure um, your mind is set on Christ. He says, um, 
Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So again, don't, don't set our minds on anger or sex or bitterness or jealousy, but on Christ. Can you imagine if we, every day, woke up and were able to set our heart and our mind on Christ? Can you imagine if we allowed the Holy Spirit within us to change our heart and our mind, we could really begin to view sex as a gift. It, it can be possible. We could do it. And for four verses in a row, Paul reminds us that we are identified with Christ. Our old self, which is ruled by sex and lust and comparison, that is now dead. And our new life with Christ now defines us. Paul is calling us to live by what is true of us. How revolutionary. So, in comparison, we'll, we'll go down to verses 5 through 7. Um, and we see that Paul tells us to put certain things to death. So let me read those verses for us. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. And so in verse 5, Paul tells us explicitly, put to death sexual immorality, lust, impurity, evil desires. All of these things are idolatry. It's worshiping the created instead of the creator. And that is harsh. But Paul has to use harsh language to get his message across. Paul doesn't say just put a few things to death. But, but Paul says sexual immorality, impurity, lust. I mean, this is an all-inclusive list. In our day and age, Paul would be saying, put to death pornography, masturbation, same-sex relationships, sex outside of marriage, oral sex, sexual assault, looking at someone with sexual thoughts. All of it, put it to death. And this idea of death is strong. Someone who is dead, I mean, they can't come back to life. They are, they're dead. They can't come back to their normal life and go about their daily routine. It is simply impossible. And Paul is saying this is what we should do with sexual immorality. That part of our life is dead. Read verse 7 again with me. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. This is past tense, not present tense. For those of you who aren't, well, English, that happened in the past. That doesn't define us now. Sexual immorality no longer defines us, so don't live that way. Set your heart and your mind on Christ. Not on the way you used to live, because that life is dead. You can no longer go back to it. And so again, you might be saying, Elizabeth, I see the biblical reason, like, I, why I should use sex as a gift, it shouldn't be a god in my life, it shouldn't be gross. But how do I do that practically? I mean, don't you know? I'm in college, I'm in Madison. This is what we do, we make mistakes, we move on. We, that's just a college student. And I know, I've, read, I've been right there with you. I mean, I even said previously where I've been. And I'm not here to cause shame or condemnation. And nor am I here to say, just stop. Just stop doing those things. I mean, well, that is a part of it. Um, so that is a part of it. Uh, by all means, you know, if, if you're currently having sex, if you're, if you're viewing pornography, if you're engaging in any of these things that have been listed above, part of it is to stop. However, the goal for tonight and for the rest of your life is to worship the Creator. The Creator who intended sex as a gift between a husband and a wife. And we can only stop worshiping sex and start worshiping the Creator through a Christian community that's filled with truth and grace over time. And so some of you sitting here tonight need to confess what's truly going on in your life. Uh, you need to finally be vulnerable, as Sarah Erickson spoke about last week. And some of you need to find accountability, which is just a fancy word for finding a few people who you, who you can be really open and real with. And, and you can be unashamed with them. They'll listen to what's going on, they're committed to asking you questions about your life, and, uh, they're committed to praying with you and for you, and telling you the truth of the Bible, even when it's not easy. And some of you, um, you may need to seek out professional help, whether it's because you've been sinned against or because of an addiction 
to sex, to pornography, something of the like. And none of these steps that I've listed are shameful. In fact, I think it's the exact opposite. I think as we, as we begin to uh, confess these things and bring them into the light, we'll really experience freedom uh, and forgiveness, maybe for the first time. And again, just to remind you, I want to help you evaluate where you're at. Do you view sex as a god? Do you view it as gross? And how can you raise your view of God and his goodness to see that he created sex as a gift to us? And so I know that was a lot to take in. We, we went like 80 miles an hour. Um, and so I'm going to ask James to come up and we're going to answer some of your questions, and so if you have, like, last minute burning questions, like, now, do it now, send it to crewpanel at gmail.com. Um, but before we begin the Q&A, let me just pray for us, because, like I said, that was a lot to take in. So, Lord, um, I thank you for this night, I thank you for the men and women that are in this room. Um, Lord, only you can transform our hearts. Holy Spirit, you, you work in ways that we just don't understand. You, you begin to transform our heart and our mind to be more like you. And we know you can transform our heart. We believe you can. And so we, we ask you to. Because we want to be men and women who live counterculturally to show Jesus and to live in a way that honors him. And so would you help us just begin to understand how we can view sex as a gift? Jesus, it's in your name we pray for all of these things. Well, hi. Hi. Good to have you up here. Yeah, this is fun. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I know. So, uh, I have some questions that you guys have been sending in. This is great. You guys have had some really good questions. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to take turns answering whatever we think we can give for you guys. It's kind of uh, encouragement and things like that. So, there's some things that I've kind of grouped together. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sending in your questions. Um, so, one of the big questions we have is, like, how far is too far, or, like, um, what are some healthy boundaries that we should have as a dating couple, um, you know, what's glorifying to God, you know, in terms of area boundaries? Do you want me to start that one? Sure. Okay. Um, well, like I said, James and I didn't have this set up very well when we first started dating. <laughs> and so, um, we, we did this better as, as time went on, but... Um, like I said, really past 11 p.m. Okay, I know that seems really to you guys. I know it does. I know. I know. Um, but as a dating couple, if you're alone, nothing good happens after that time. I wouldn't suggest that you go together after that. Uh, alone in a dark room with roommates not home. It doesn't work well. Um, and yeah, I think I would I would have friends uh, aware of who you're dating. Have them be friends with those people. And ask them to ask questions about how it's going, uh, kind of where you guys are at. How would you guys that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you're real with yourself and you're asking this question, like, I think you really want to know. And so some of you, if you're being real, like, know what's too much for you, right? Like, for some guys, you're really visual. And so you need to have really strong boundaries with what your girlfriend is wearing um, or just even being alone together. I and mean, I've heard, like, Guys have been really great in this area. They've had a lot of victories, so they just say, you know, like tonight's not a good night to hang out. Like I just, I just know I'm not in a good place, so I'm not gonna come over to your house, right? Uh, so couples have really strong boundaries, and they're great. Like I'm not gonna kiss you until we get engaged. That's a legitimate thing because they realize, you know, I just don't wanna, I don't wanna see my relationship with you as a guy or an idol. So yeah, it's just you know, once you make that mistake, once you go, you know, it's really it's like. Once you go under the, under the shirt, what's next? You know, it's like, well, I already did that, so it's okay. And she left me, so I'm going to try something else, right? So we're sinful. <laughs> Guys, you can manipulate boundaries all the time. You know, technically we're not kissing, but you are dry humping, right? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, boundaries are no good if nobody knows about them. No. So, 
Uh, another thing that came up uh, is just an issue of boundaries again. It's just like emotional boundaries and what, um, how far is too far? Um, you know, when you say I love you, when you, um, you know, you know, can we pray together? That type of stuff. Sure. Um, Do you want to answer that? Sure. I think that's again. You need to know. How much do you want to share? Are you sharing this to really get to know somebody? Are you in a place in your relationship where this is appropriate? Like, we've been dating a week. Okay, I'm not going to tell you, you know, all my emotions and my heart so that, you know, you really want to be attracted to me, right? So, um, you know, we encourage you not to pray with each other. You know, just real spiritual intimacy can lead to physical intimacy. Um, you know, it's not true for everybody. Some couples really think, yeah, we can really pray together. Uh, believing friends who will uh, 
will kind of hold you to the standards of what God's Word says. And, uh, if you don't have friends who are Christians, um, start, I would start that. Uh, you know, maybe that's uh, meeting the people around you sitting here tonight. Um, maybe that's coming up and talking to one of us staff members and saying, I, I want to get more involved in a Christian community. How can I do it? And we'll help you. We'll, we'll help you think of ways to do that. Um, and, and so you yeah, ask people who you know you can trust. Uh, either they're not going to take what you say and run all over town with it, but you, you know that there are people who are trustworthy and reliable, and they, they want to walk with God. Uh, this is a great one. Um, how, do sexual, how does sexual temptation change in marriage, uh, in the realm of personal struggles or masturbation? Um, you know, I think, in the guy perspective, like, I kind of immaturely thought, oh, once I get married, I won't have a struggle anymore. Right? Like, just gone, I'm married, it's like a sex all I want. Um, but, really, it's almost like, okay, if I become a Christian, then I don't have to worry about sin anymore. Right? Like, no, that's not true. Like, you have an enemy, and he's out to get you, and he wants more than anything to destroy your life. And so, your marriage. marriage particularly. If Satan could do anything, it'd be to ruin our marriage so that we wouldn't have a platform to speak about, or even just be effective in ministry. And so, you know, as a guy, it, temptation is still there. It's like, you know, things that you see. And sometimes it can even feel like I have to come at more guilt and shame, actually. It's like, I'm married now. You know, like, I shouldn't have these thoughts or be tempted. But the reality is, I'm still human. And even in the great relationship that we have, um, my goal is to pursue closer intimacy with my wife. And so it actually spurs me on to, to grow closer. But temptation is totally still there as a married couple. Because um, you actually have more confidence. When you're married, so it's <laughs> frustration and stress. Stress can be a trigger for temptation. Um, maybe, maybe last one. Yeah, last one. Um, so, how do you? I think this is a real. This is just great. It's just I think real. Thanks for saying it. So, how do you know you're sexually compatible with your future spouse? Um, they say that make sure that you take a car out for a spin before you buy it. <laughs> So, uh, you have to pay for it, so if you have to 
put money on the table, it's more of an incentive than, I think, than free stuff. So that's what we got. Uh, yeah. So if you'd like to talk with us afterwards, we're available. So thanks.